So I'm here today with Grant LaFontaine, the CEO and founder of Whatnot, which is the single fastest growing marketplace in the United States today, maybe in the world, maybe in tech history ever. Um, Grant, you'll correct the, the details here, but whatever it is, Whatnot is a phenomenon. It is a specialized e-commerce marketplace that is growing insanely fast. And of course, there's a reason for that. And the reason is there's some component that's working incredibly well at Whatnot. And hopefully, Grant, you'll share with us what that is. But did I get that introduction? Did I get my facts sort of close? It was pretty good, maybe a little bit better than I would have put it. Um, you know, for the past two years, we've been the fastest growing marketplace in the United States and we will probably be it for a third year in a row um, to give you some. I think those are the, the true statistics. And of course, then coming back to what's fueling that, there's something that's causing that to happen. And whatever it is, you are likely the best in the world at that thing, because, again, it's the evidence is you're growing the fastest. So I, I, I blatantly I coach you, Grant, and my experience of you, Grant, is that what you and what not are uniquely great at is the marketing component and specifically the growth marketing component. So I would love to start with that growth marketing piece and then jump back to sort of marketing overall, because marketing and growth marketing is something that every company needs to do. And frankly, most companies struggle with because it's so hard to get metrics. It's so hard to track success and failure. So therefore, it's so hard to keep a marketing team accountable. And oftentimes they just ask for more and more money, but you can't track the results exactly. So it becomes a trust me kind of game. Very difficult to hold the marketing team accountable. So let's dive in. You figured out a way, Grant, to make growth marketing work really well. So if you're open to it, let's first have you define what is growth marketing and then are you willing to share what is you're doing? I know these are state secrets. So let's share as much as you're willing to. The way um, marketing set up right now, whatnot, is we basically have two marketing or marketing and sales teams. We have our engineering team, which rolls up into engineering, which is actually our growth team. And so that team today is like 15 or 16 engineers, a couple data scientists, um, designer uh we don't have any pms on that team yet and this uh, is just the growth team within engineering this is not the engineers that are building the site itself no so to give you give you context on kind of the scale of whatnot we're probably about 400 employees right now 120 engineers and then 15 to 20 uh just on growth and then we have our what would be a more traditional sales and marketing team Perfect. That is separate from that, which we call our, it's our go-to-market team. And that's a mixture of marketing people and salespeople. Perfect. Let's come back to the growth side for a second. Can you please define what is growth marketing? Just so we all understand it. And I'll repeat it back. So to, I'll try to dumb it down even further. So for, I'll tell you what it is for us. <laughs> I'm sure people define it differently depending on um, what they're doing. So for us, it's really two things. One, it's performance marketing. And then two, it's um, kind of just a team that works horizontally across the product uh, to deliver growth. Uh, generally focused on a few um, specific growth levers that are um, particularly powerful for our business. So both like the levers and the funnel. So those are the two jobs of that team, paid marketing and then um, kind of uh, optimizing our core marketing channels and our funnel. When you have a product that you have or any product or service, you need to make potential buyers aware of the fact that you have this product. And so the way you do it, one easy way is to pay for advertising. You can pay for advertising on Facebook, on Google, you can pay for influencers, and there's all kinds of things you could do, but you don't know which ones are gonna work and bring users to your site and then have them purchase. So growth marketing is experimenting with different paid vehicles to reach users and then testing to see which ones actually bring users to your site and have them buy. And then you continue to double down on the paid channels as you describe that are having the most success and stop the ones that are not having success. So the key is lots of experimentation and then 
tracking the results. And of course, the second part is the hard part. Did I get that close? Yep, that's spot on. Fantastic. Now, this is the big conundrum. Most people find it really hard to track the results. They do a bunch of experiments, then a bunch of purchases happen on their site, and they're like, whoa, where did those people come from? I don't know. I don't know what they saw. I don't know what they didn't see. You've seemed to figure that out more than most. And I think you gave us a clue as to how you did it, because you talked about your growth marketing team being in engineering with 15 engineers and a data scientist and designer. So I think that's a clue. So before we set up our team, you know, we thought about there's there's a bunch of different areas where you can put in. I, I've talked to different teams, put it in different places. Probably most people put it up into marketing. And there tends to no be- No question most people put it in marketing. Yeah, <laughs> marketing goes in marketing. Um, yeah, but there, there's challenges with that because um, it's very, a lot, when you look at the, you, you mentioned this, when you look at the biggest problem and hardest thing to do with paid marketing, particularly today after all the iOS changes, the singular hardest problem is actually tracking it and seeing if you're getting an ROI. And because that's the single hardest problem, that's not necessarily something that falls strictly within a marketing skill set. That's more of an engineering data science skill set. So we made the choice early on, um, as opposed to build our growth marketing in the marketing team, we built it in the engineering team. Now, there are trade-offs, um, but we felt like given that was the biggest problem, the right trade-off was to put it in engineering where it becomes much more of a math equation, which is, which is you know, the biggest and hardest part of performance marketing today, particularly after all the iOS changes. So back in the day, we're talking about a year and a half ago, when I, before iOS 14, the iPhone allowed you to track user behavior on apps that weren't your, yours. So Facebook, for example, could see where a person was going, all the apps they used, all the content they saw, and could serve up ads that directly attached to what the user was looking at generally. Apple figured this out and said, you know what? We're not going to allow Facebook to do that anymore. And with iOS 14, which came out, I think, a year and a half ago or December-ish, I think, of, you know, 2021, somewhere in that area, late 2021, iOS 14 no longer allows or gives you a warning saying, hey, would you like this app to track you across your behavior? And you, most people say no. And so all of a sudden, like on a dime, Facebook could no longer see what users were doing, could no longer serve up content directly to them, could no longer see what they did afterward with that content, whether they bought and so it made Facebook advertising much less effective, but it also made it difficult for you and all consumers of Facebook advertising to know what was what the effectiveness was of their Facebook advertising or any other advertising. So now you're stuck in the same boat that all other purchases are of, of paid advertising. You don't actually really know anymore because Apple doesn't allow you to, to track it easily. So what you're saying is we now use engineers to figure out other ways of understanding who saw that paid advertising and who came to our site. You're not giving away how exactly you do it, but you're letting engineers solve that problem, not someone who's a marketer who has never had to solve that problem before, isn't trained to, and doesn't have any technical knowledge of how to track IP users across the internet. Is that That's close? Right. It, and it that's right. It's mostly how you implement your ad systems and how you um, kind of forecast what users are actually valued at, which ends up being an engineering and data analytics problem. So that's what Fantastic. a lot of the iOS changes did. Fantastic. I love it. And I know that, you know, you say you're 15 now, but I know six months ago, I think you were one person in this growth marketing team. Is that right? Uh, or maybe a year ago. So, uh, yeah, so a year ago, um, so December 2021, we were one person. Um, so, and today we probably have six people working on it, maybe. Okay. Um, so, so we have some of the other teams focused on other parts of the funnel as well. Got it. And the, the only reason I point that out is, is to say that you've got this you know, team of 15, I say six are on it. I don't want people to think that they need that many people in order to get going. You had one for quite a long time. And that yeah, person... we had one for months until we got it to scale. And then we only started hiring 
more people when it became a bigger part of the business to solve more problems and scale it out. I'm a big proponent of, unless you know exactly what you're doing, you do not throw people at the problem because people scales it. But if you haven't figured out what you're going to do and what problem you're going to solve, it just complicates solving the problem because it's a small number of people that you actually want to solve the problem. Fantastic. I love it. Music to my ears. I completely agree with that philosophy. And so Grant, I'm going to push it here and I'm going to ask you, you don't have to answer, but if someone listening here, CEO listening here says, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take an engineer. I'm going to say, now your only job is growth marketing, figure out which of these paid vehicles are actually working. What, what is the first thing you'd advise them that engineer to go do? Now, this is the state secret. This is where you probably say, Matt, I can't answer that question. That's fine. You don't have to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I mean, you have to, you just, I, it's fine. I'm, I don't think we're hiding anything. And, and I think the, the ad landscape is still changing so much that even <laughs> what we're doing today will not be what we're doing in six months. Like this is such for how kind of Apple keeps updating and changing its policies around, um, how you can track things. Um, you know, I think the first thing we did is just like implement Apple scan, which allows us to get a, a finite window of data on, on users and see if they can convert. And then once we have that, we forecast out our LTV curves based on initial data, which then requires you to have, um, this is why I say it's a data analytics problem, which requires you to like figure out what the right tools are to forecast. So for us, and it probably does depend on your business and, and how much you're spending, but for us, the first 24 to 48 hours of purchase are highly, highly indicative of day 360. And so with a small amount of data, we can get a high level of precision on our LTV curves. And so, um, you know, that's basically what we did. We're, we're still tweaking and updating the systems today. Um, and then Apple's rolling out some, some new, um, I think they're extending the scan data window to like 30 days. I forget what the name of the update is. So we'll be updating these all through time. I think the, at the end of the day, um, paid marketing is, is mostly a math equation. And so what you're trying to do is figure out who's purchasing, how much they're spending and trying to forecast out the LTV. So, um, to make sure that it's worth the cost that you're paying on marketing. So you need to know your LTV and CAC, and therefore you need to set up the analytics and the tracking to figure that out. So that's probably step one. Fantastic. I'm so glad I asked that question because that's a phenomenal answer. And really it's, the, there's two parts. One is, as I heard, one is making sure you see what users are doing, but then you want to take a few days worth of data and project out a year. And that's really the effort. The effort is the projection and so seeing, comparing against all the other data you have around users that you've already had for more than one year and seeing what they did in the first few days and comparing it against this new cohort and what they're doing in these first few days. Is that right? That's right. And of course, it, it's even more complicated because you're not sure how it's trading off against different channels. So you're, you're over time trying to get more and more data and information to make your estimate more precise. Grant, thank you. I feel like we just, that is it. I mean, if we do no more, that was hugely valuable. So thank you. Now let's jump to sort of the wider side. And that is marketing overall. You've clearly figured out growth marketing better than most or better than any. Let's talk about marketing in general. You talk about you package your team as a sales and marketing team together. What do you do and what advice do you give to someone who's starting out saying, I don't know anything about marketing. I'm the CEO of this company and I clearly we have to do something and I don't understand it. And I also have heard nightmare stories about how I hire a you know, chief marketing officer and then there's just no accountability and the, the person just asks for more and more budget and can't point to any specific results at the end of the year. For us, we never thought about it as a marketing problem. We just thought about it as a gross problem, which is like, you know, you have two core jobs when you're building a company. One, make something that people find very valuable and then figure out how to grow the thing. And I guess make, make money off and make sure you're not like losing money. So it's three things, I guess. Um, and so in the very, very early days of, of the company, we just had a set of hypotheses for how we might grow. Um, both say with paid ads, but also on kind of what we call our go-to-market function, which is 
a cross between sales, marketing, and what I'd call category management, which is like figuring out the supply on the marketplace and things like that. And, you know, we didn't know, we just took a small number of people and tested things. So it'd be like, all right, we'll, what happens when we onboard this seller? How do we get demand over? What are the, we work with influencers? Do we do events? Do we do all of these things? Um, and, you know, what I'll say is we actually didn't hire a head of marketing until two months ago. So we actually never officially had a marketing team uh, until two months ago. And the initial kind of go-to-market and marketing strategy was really built by me and the founding team through a bunch of small experiments and iterations. So I think the 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 couple of things I'd say for people who are like throwing money at like marketing or think it's a black box, one you know, if you start a company, it's your job to figure out how to grow it. And you should be able to do that in most instances in a small way to then expand and scale it out. It's the same thing with people, which is don't throw a bunch of money on a thing until you've really figured it out because you're just trying to like, if you haven't solved the problem, you're just going to throw money into a black box. Um, and we didn't think about it as a marketing problem. We just thought about it as a growth problem and ran a bunch of tests that we thought would grow the app based on what we knew about our users. And that I think enabled us not to think in kind of like black box ways where we just, we hired a bunch of business athletes who could do sales. They could do a little bit of marketing and um, really how we grow whatnot is we figure out how to make a category better and how to get demand to bring more demand, supply to bring more supply and grow the health of the category and create a flywheel. And then we just cake on categories on top. So the, the kind of, critical thing for us to figure out and it'll be different for every business um, but our growth engine is basically category growth and so what we had to do is figure out how to grow a category and then we knew there were thousands of categories and we just cake them on the top of each other fantastic just for example what's an example of one two three categories so our first category we launched into was funko pops which are little vinyl dolls second was pokemon cards um month ago we launched into electronics so like products, um, physical product categories, because we sell physical, we're an e-commerce site, basically. Fantastic. All right. So now what I'm hearing, which I did not know until now, so this is awesome to hear, is that basically you were, Grant, were the head of marketing up until two months ago, or somebody was who you didn't call a head of marketing. You said we. So yeah, we had a head of go-to-market. His name was Armand, and he's, he's still head of go-to-market. Um, and so he ran that team which was mostly sales sales folks with a little, a few category marketers mixed into category teams. So our growth engine, and again, it depends what your growth engine is. Our growth engine was growing categories. So everything under go to market was organized around category. And then the primary engine within a category to grow is actually onboarding sellers. So it was mostly a sales function, but you did need demand to throw on top of it. So we had a minority of category marketers mixed into our category teams which enabled us never to have an official centralized marketing team. Got it. That's why it's not centralized because you had basically business units that each had their own growth marketer or their own marketer within the business unit. So the- Yes, and, but even are, that was like later, later on in the category. So for instance, we just launched in the UK. We have two people in the UK, neither of them is a marketer and we're growing 80% month over month. Got it. But they're responsible for making decisions, for somehow attracting sellers onto their category. Correct. And how, are they, how are they doing it? A um, lot of just like direct sales, reaching out to good people, referrals, attending events. Um, so every, you know, niche Pokemon conference, we're there. Every sports card conference, uh, we're there. Um, uh, so, you know, it just, to me, again, it comes back to who is our seller, who is our buyer, where do they hang out and how do we get in front of them? Cause that's what mar marketing is like. We don't have to do marketing. We, we attract buyers and we attract sellers with a value problem. We figure out where they are and we get there. Um, and then for us, the best mechanism to do that was not build out like a big centralized marketing team. Um, and even if you look at, let's say our marketing budget in the UK, it's like, it's, minuscule we didn't launch into a new country with a large marketing budget we basically spent i don't know 10k a month or something like that something really tiny amazing basically when you create a category 
you have a solution for someone who's got a problem. The person who's got a problem is a seller who wants to sell that, who wants to sell Pokemon cards, but doesn't have a good place to sell them. You have a solution. You have a good place to sell them. So you just need to find people with that problem, Pokemon card owners who want to sell them and don't have a good place for it. And you got to figure out where do those people hang out? Where are their eyeballs, basically? What are they looking at? What websites? What physical conferences do they go to? What whatever? And that's where you put information or your team will put information about whatnot so that they can see it and then go, oh, there's a solution to my problem. Boom. And they come to whatnot. Is that close? That's basically on the seller side. Now we do, because we are a marketplace, we do have to get both going at once. So we do spend some time on the buyer side, but um, typically it's the minority of time. Fantastic. Because you have the sellers, the buyers will find those sellers wherever, wherever they exist online. To some extent. We definitely have to help push it over a little bit. Okay. Um, but this, the same mechanic applies, which is who's buying Pokemon cards? Where are they? What do they value? And how do we get um, that value in front of them to get them on web? Which ends up being events, influencer marketing, paid ads on social media, um, referrals and, and things of that nature. Yeah. And then if I were to go a step further, what you're also saying is that in whatnot, you're forced to think of people in niche categories, both sellers and buyers, because you're selling niche products, niche categories. So it would be stupid for you to go out and do paid marketing that's like general to the entire world because that's super expensive. And you're only going after a very small slice of people. So instead, what you're doing is you're thinking of where do the Pokemon sellers, where are their eyeballs, and the Pokemon buyers, where are their eyeballs, and try to get there. And that, very specifically, is not that expensive because it's in probably a unique location that only people who want to be there are people who are interested in Pokemon buyers and sellers, and that's not that many advertisers in the world. So you can get it for close to nothing and sometimes nothing. And so... If you're to translate this to any other company, my guess the advice would be, and you tell me if I'm close, is that even if you have buyers that span the globe in terms of who they are, there's they are these are actually a collection of niches. And if you can identify what the niches are and then identify which of yours are the strongest niches, the ones that are actually buying the most and paying the most, then you can identify where that niche, where their eyeballs are, and you can actually get much more effective advertising and promotion to that niche as opposed to promoting to the entire category of humans on the planet or business owners on the planet if you're an enterprise company. Is that close? Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think the, um, I take it even a step further which is if you get very specific for who you're going after, not only can you make it the marketing much more efficient, um, you can really set up a value prop that people respond to. Because if you're trying to be everything to everyone, uh, you'll be nothing to, to nobody um, right. or when anybody. You, so when you say value prop, let me translate that and see if I got it. Value prop meaning you can you, you if you go very specific, you now know what problem that niche person has. So instead of saying, hey, we've got this, you know, great website, you can say, do you have this problem? Do you have the problem that you don't have a good place to sell your Pokemon cards? And the person goes, yeah, that's me. And then all of a sudden they'll emotionally respond to whatever comes next, which is your solution. Is that what you mean by value prop? There's an even another layer, which I would say is you can also make sure your product's good for those people. So the, the, mm. the narrower you go, um, your marketing is more efficient, your value prop is more tuned. And, you know, when you're starting a business from scratch, uh, you're so, so limited a resource to make your product great. You can also make your product great for that small number of people. So mm -hmm. as you can probably, you know, surmise, I'm a, I'm a big fan of starting off very small and then expanding. I'm not aware of, I can't come up with off the top of my head any large consumer platform that actually hasn't started in some sort of niche and then expanded outwards from there. Got it. So again, I'm going to translate. So Matt, 
by focusing first just and I don't forget that what was the very first one the Funko Pops Funko Pops that's a very unique kind of seller and a very unique kind of buyer and if we made our product so it would just satisfy Funko Pop sellers and Funko Pop buyers we ignored the ability to make this site usable by any other kind of seller. Some other sellers might need to do size charts if they're selling shoes. Like we didn't have any of that stuff. It's just what was only what was needed for Funko Pop sellers. That's it. And by being that specific, we created a product that was really good for Funko Pop selling and Funko Pop buying. And once we dominated that category, then first of all, we not only did we know where to find these people, but the solution that we were giving them was actually a really good solution for them. So it was actually an easy conversion to make because we really were the best solution for Funko Pop buying and selling. That's what you mean by value proposition. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I would say is, I think marketing and your products and, and all of these things, they're all one. Mm -hmm. they're all, <laughs> you can't think of them as almost distinct units. Um, so one of the things that we made sure like I had mentioned this earlier, like, you know, the, the system for creating a good business, have you created value? Can you figure out how to grow it? And can you make money from it? Yeah. And so if all of those things just don't link together, you don't have anything. Um, and so I think if you, the mistake you could make is you treat marketing or growth as an afterthought to your business. It's actually, mm -hmm. it is the business. It is the product. If your product can't grow mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and you don't have a plan to grow it, you don't have a business. Right. And so, Perfect. and you can, for us, it was just like who we're going after the value prop for them and making sure the product actually fulfilled and being really, yeah. really narrow because when we started, we were 400 people today, but when we started, what not, there were four of us. So there's only so much yeah. you can do. Yeah. And again, I'm going to keep translating in the way that makes sense to me and tell me if I've got it. So what you're saying is Matt product and marketing are, are the same because what you're doing is you're going out and talking to people and understanding what their problem is. Funko Pop, I started talking to Funko Pop sellers and they didn't have a place to sell. So I now know what their problem is. I now create a solution for that. I create a, a, a site where Funko Pop selling is really easy. But I now, by talking to these people, I know two things. One, I know what their problem is, so I know how to solve it. And two, I know where they live and where they hang out, so I know how to make them aware of the solution that I now have for them. That's why product and growth are completely intertwined. The person who's making the discovery about what needs to be built for product should be the same person that's then going out and making those people aware because that per, the, the product person knows this niche now and knows the actual human beings and their behaviors and is the right person to know where to find their eyeballs. Is that close? Yeah, that's that's entirely accurate with the nuance of obviously when you get to 400 people, you have to specialize, but in, the, but if you're starting off anything new and the person building it doesn't know how to grow it and vice versa, you're going to be in trouble. Grant, I think this is a radical approach. I've actually never heard anyone say this before, and I've never even thought about it and it makes complete and utter sense to me. And it's wild. I mean, I think what you're also saying is you created a bunch of YC startups. Each of your categories is its own, sounds like it's its own YC startup. It's a small team who's responsible for both product and growth. Oh, so there's new, it's, it's not the case anymore. Okay. Um, so this is why I Was said, it so ever? Early, um, well, so in the early days of whatnot, it was my co-founder Logan building everything us collaborating on product and me running go to market. And so what was always true, and that's it's still true a, today. It's clearly it's, a YC startup version. Yeah, so okay. what's what's true today is that go to market and product are highly interlinked. Mm -hmm. Now we do have two, we do have two different, we have different people. So if you look at all but one of our teams, we do actually have one team that is actually truly full stack. Um, mm -hmm. That's our biggest, it's in our biggest category. Um, and most of those teams, so like this is say our collectibles team or our, our fashion team. Um, you know, our fashion team is sales and marketing. 
um, and they're responsible for growing the category. So they don't have engineering on that team specifically. Um, but what I, what I end up doing is I bridge the two. And increasingly, we are actually building specific product teams and go-to-market teams and attaching them together for any big bets. So with fashion, for instance, um, we got to a pretty big scale without doing that um, because I ended up being the bridge. Um, but with fashion, we actually are hiring an engineering team specifically for it. And they don't, they actually have different reporting lines, but they act, they function as one team. It kind of ends up being more of a, you know, product pod model with kind of go to market mixed in. Um, so, you know, at 400, we only started to do that maybe around 300 people for a long time. It was probably me playing bridge between product and go to market. So it's very, it's very, very important that uh, certainly in consumer, I, I can't speak anything about software as a service. I don't know anything about those businesses, but for a consumer business, particularly in today's environment where it's much harder to grow, if your product isn't helping you grow and your growth isn't informing your product, you're probably going to be in trouble. So in the end, the people that come to me and say, Matt, how do I create a marketing function from scratch? I answer I'm going to turn to this because even though you say you don't know anything about enterprise, enterprise is just a bunch of human beings making decisions and consumers are just a bunch of people making decisions. Now, the only difference in enterprise is there's, it's a group of people, whereas in consumer, it's one person. So they don't have to consult with each other In enterprise. They usually consult with each other. So you have to make sure all of the people in the decision group have awareness. Whereas in consumer, just one person at a time. Other than that, it's the same thing. It's, a, it's human beings making decisions and being aware of solutions to their problem, being made aware of solutions to their problems. So I think you actually know more about enterprise than you give yourself credit for. And um, the, so it sounds like the answer is don't just hire a head of marketing and then pray. Do it yourself. Make the people, you, the founder themselves, was the one who originally talked to end users or potential end users and discovered their problem and then created the solution. That same founder now knows who those end users are and needs to figure out ways to get this information, the solution to those end users. As you continue to grow, each new level of growth, have product and marketing be intertwined, be the same human on your side. I think that's what you're saying. And if it is, again, it's freaking radical and I love it. My rules of thumb, if the founding team can't figure out how to grow and market their business to scale, no one else is going to because you understand the business, the consumer and the product better than anyone else. So if you think you can hire someone um, to do that, you're going to be sorely mistaken because um, the people are going to hire what they're, what they're going to hire, say like an exact, they're going to. They're there to help you scale. They're not there to help you figure out a lot of the zero to one problems. The number of people who can do zero to one problems is a very, very small number. And like truly figuring out how to grow a business is, is, is definitely that. Once you start to scale, if, if growth and products um, do not like mutually inform each other, um, you'll get into a place, I suspect in most businesses, where you'll stop growing. It's probably more acute in a marketplace business like ours because growth informs, like growth creates the product. So the more buyers we have, the more sellers we have, the better the product experience is. Mm -hmm. And and like half of the product experience is the buyers and sellers that come on board. So if you get the wrong ones, you actually construct the wrong product. Um, so I think that's probably why it's, it's uh, so tightly linked with us. Grant, this has been mind blowing. I knew that you had knowledge that was super valuable that I wanted you to share with the world. I had no idea it was this radical and this good. So thank you for being transparent because frankly, this is the secret sauce or at least one of them. But in, in my view, the key secret sauce of whatnot, and you just transparently shared it with the world. And I am so grateful that you were willing to do that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. I don't think um, none of it's too secret. The hard bit with all this stuff is going and doing it. Right and there's always nuances to every business. So I couldn't, ta even if I wanted to hand over the secret sauce for whatnot, it's not going to work for your business exactly. I think there are some principles that you can follow, um, like we just talked about, that can be helpful though.
Yeah. Well, as you say, it, the key is understanding your your particular user, what their problems are and where their eyeballs are. And those are the those are the two key things. And the person who's talking to them will know both. I freaking love it. Grant, you're amazing. Thank you very much. Is there anything you want to talk about or share before we end? Um, we're hiring across all functions at whatnot. <laughs> So check on search whatnot jobs if you're looking. Fantastic. Awesome. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of hits from after this. Right on. <laughs>